My topic here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk here and then uh, we'll take some questions afterwards. And um, you know, if, you're, if you haven't been scanned, uh, we do have a booth, uh, 616, and um, we uh, have three reports we're going to send to whoever wants them. And you can get an idea, if you're not familiar with our publications, you can get an idea of our approach and how we do things. And, um, we hope you'll check us out if you're not already uh, a subscriber. Uh, the pig there at the top of the at the top of the uh, slide there that's our um, uh, uh, trademark, I guess you would call it. Our, we're Capitalist Times. That's the publishing company, and we have four advisories, and one of them is Conrad's Utility Investor, and that's what I'll be speaking from primarily um, today. And. Uh, Basically, this is what I'm going to be doing in these. Uh, I, I do have a fair number of slides, but th this is more or less the, uh, the approach and, and what, what we're going to be uh, going over here. Again, these are our, uh, our advisories. We have uh, Conrad's Utility Investor. That's actually, you know, it's a continuation of work I've been doing for about 30 years in the utility and essential services area. Capitalist Times is broad-based. Uh, Energy and Income Advisor. If you were listening to Elliot, uh, my partner, earlier today, he was speaking a lot from that. We're all, we have a joint presentation tomorrow um, that we'll be speaking from. We cover all the MLPs and so forth, C Canadian stocks, pretty a full range of energy. And then pig versus bear is our trading product. And um, we cover, we come, we come at it a lot from the energy point, but we also do uh, a lot in other markets as well. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's us, that's what we do. Um, if you're interested in any of this, uh, you can send an email there. You can visit the sites. You can also call Sherry, who is our uh, director of customer service, or the head and tail of customer service. But she's very, uh, very friendly and would be happy to answer any questions you have. So we're basically, we do, we do write about a lot of things. Uh, we write about uh, commodities. We write about bonds often. But generally, we talk a lot about stocks. And this is a slide I, I made. Just to make a certain point, and that is that really uh, stocks are really the game at this point, and they have been for a while. Uh, the robot investing, I know a lot of people, uh, and in fact, if you are, have, a, have a large account with a, with a broker, chances are you've been pulled in there and they've tried to put you into some sort of algorithmic situation where you have, um, uh, you buy a certain amount of stocks, ETFs, and a certain amount of bond ETFs based on your age. Uh, I don't think we've really seen what might happen uh, from that if, uh, when we do have a really big uh, stock market event, but I really think you're actually better off with choosing your own investments. So income investing, uh, I, I do think that this also still continues to have a lot of merit. Uh, it's in this, again, sort of a slide about our approach a little bit. The bird in hand, you know, you get a dividend, that's a sure. Uh, a sure return. There are still many safe and high growing yields that I'm going to be bringing to your attention here. Um, and a lot of the values that you see out there are because too many investors are really fixated on a couple of things that they really sh shouldn't spend so much time on. I know that the, the uh, uh, television programs and so forth, that's pretty much all you hear about. But there are a lot more important things that drive um, returns. And uh, again, we watch what companies do. We do what we call the, the deep down analysis. Um, and we, we do pay attention to sectors. We do, uh, and particularly in the trading product, um, we sometimes bet on that. But what we want to own is not so much governed by sector, it's more governed by the company. And then the last point there, this is actually something, I, one of my headlines in uh, uh, Conrad's utility investor recently was don't be afraid to buy low you know, resolve not to buy, not to be afraid to buy low in 2017. And the idea is that, you know, the stock market doesn't fall all at once. Uh, um, sometimes stocks will go faster down than others. So you often have an opportunity to buy a stock at a really good price that you really want to own um, when the market is in a different place. The market may not be bottom. Maybe the market's still going down. And a lot of people will look at that and say, well, I don't want to buy anything because the market's coming down. But if you go in there, you buy uh, the stock when it hits a certain price, uh, you're going to do pretty well. And we, we did some things with that uh, involving dream buy prices, uh, particularly about a year ago with our energy companies when all those stocks were coming down. Um, and following those, you're able to get in pretty cheaply. 
Uh, energy stocks have come back a lot. Uh, pretty much the whole market has, has done pretty well. Utilities as well. So there's not so many opportunities to buy at dream buy prices, but there are opportunities to buy at good value-based targets. So again, uh, focusing on the individual stocks, focusing on stocks, focusing on, on growing companies with safe high yields. Um, this, is def this, is, this is the approach and it's what <coughs> I think will do well um, in 2017 and going forward. Um, you know, I, I, talking to, a minute ago, answering the question about the Fed and, and utilities. Um, I've mentioned quite a bit to subscribers, presented a lot of information about what's happened in various tightening cycles. So when the Fed starts raising the Fed funds rate, what happens to dividend paying stocks? What happens to uh, REITs? What happens to utilities? So you, the Dow Utility Average, we do have an average for going back uh, this period. Um, so I've looked at different periods. I've talked a lot about the period from June 2004 to June 2006 when the Dow Jones Utility Average uh, total return was about 60%, uh, about four times what the S&P did over that time. And that was, again, in a period where the Fed raised the Fed funds from one to five and a quarter percent. So a pretty protracted tightening cycle. Why was that the case? Why did they go up over that time? Well, because the Fed was raising in tandem with the economy getting stronger. So these utilities, like all these companies are stocks, and their earnings picture gets brighter when the economy starts getting brighter. Um, I, you know, so that's what happened in June 2004, June 2006. If you look a little bit further back here, um, all these tightening cycles, you'll see somewhat the same dynamic happening. And this goes back to July of 1954 um, from the data that we have at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and, and the Fed Bank of St. Louis. And it's when the Fed uh, began using the Fed funds rate as a tool for um, managing interest rate policy, for managing monetary uh, policy. And if you go back here, you can see a couple of periods where the utilities didn't do so well. Well, I mean, the, most of the market didn't do very well from July 1971 to July 1974. Uh, utilities also did pretty poorly from February 1994 to February 1995. Um, they underperformed the market. But to some extent, that was, um, if, you, if you remember the 1994 period, uh, we had a deregulation scare that basically drove a lot of people out of their utility stocks. Uh, it was short-lived, but it was pretty vicious as it went on. I think if you look at the most, but if you look at the most compelling uh, date period there, it's, it's uh, actually a period where you, sh you see the Dow utility average down about 2.9%. That doesn't include uh, dividends paid. So um, if you look over that period, the return on the utilities was positive, but the Fed funds rate went from 4 and, and uh, 4.75, 4 and 3 quarters percent to 20%. And I, I, most of us were alive back then. It's um, a period where we had hyperinflation. So again, just making the point that we've had these tightening cycles before. Utilities have pretty much done well in all these tightening cycles. So this is just plain facts. I, why, why does this pers persist? That, um, why do people persist that, that utilities sell off in periods of rising interest rates? Um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a pat theory and it gets repeated over and over and over again. And people have bought into it. But if you look at what's happened so far in this first, uh, you know, since the Fed started raising rates this time, December 2015 to January 2017, or, or now February 2017, utilities are up about 20% over that period. So again, even though uh, you know, that conventional wisdom persists, even though right in front of people's faces, uh, something the complete opposite is happening. So that's, that's kind of my spiel on utilities in the Fed. Um, you know, and uh, I don't know when uh, people will, this will become the conventional wisdom. Probably it'll be about the time when we'll have to start thinking something different. But again, this is the pretty much, uh, this is pretty much what's happened. And here's another way of looking at it. This is a graph of the Dow Jones utility average in the 2004 to 2006 period. Um, as you can see, utilities rallied pretty strongly over that, uh, over that period when the Fed started raising rates. So um, another group, MLPs, a lot of us own. Um, and MLPs over that same time period rallying pretty hard. Why is that? Well, again, because the economy is getting stronger, the important drivers like energy prices, like, you know, things were reviving in the energy sector in the United States. The MLPs started doing well over that time. So again, uh, interest rates, 
I think are, uh, they can be a concern, particularly to weaker companies that are higher leveraged, but it's not a, not a death sentence for utilities, far from it. So that's, uh, that's one of the, th you know, if you go back to that slide where I was saying investors are too focused on a couple of things that they shouldn't be, that's one of the areas. The other area is politics. And what I, what I did here with this graph, this is a graph of First Solar, and uh, going back over the period of the Obama administration being in power. Um, I could have done another, I could have done other graphs, uh, one being um, of the uh, Guggenheim ETF, which is a bunch of solar stocks. But the point I want to make to you here is even during the most pro-solar administration, I think, ever, um, and definitely driving a lot of investment, driving a lot of favorable, there were favorable tax uh, credits, there were, there, you know, all, anyway, all sorts of things, federal lands um, opened up, uh, the Defense Department's been a huge supporter of solar energy, they want to be able to have mobile units that they can, um, don't have to depend on gasoline to move around, particularly maybe out in the desert. Uh, but despite all that, it was a horrible time to own, quote unquote, solar stocks. Why was that? Well, we just had an overproduction. And a lot of companies, particularly coming out of China, produced a lot of, uh, a lo have produced a lot of panels. The price of solar panels is down about 30% over the last year. It's down about 60% over um, uh, the last two or three years. And the technology's advanced. But these companies that make these components have faced vicious competition and they've, uh, they've lost out. And we had actually had a pretty good short uh, of First Solar um, earlier or late last year based on that. They really started to show these, um, you know, the, 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 the ill effects of a supply glut of, uh, of solar panels. So, so that, that, and that doesn't mean that the Obama administration wasn't great for solar, but it just means that if you had, when the Obama administration came in, if you had said, they're going to they're going to have solar solar's going to be great solar stocks are going to do great you would have lost your shirt so i think what we have to do is take this into uh, consideration with with what we've just seen in in this election again i think as far as utilities go and i said this in november in our november issue but the results of that election were considerably more positive for uh, for utilities but Mostly, it was because it all, the, the good stuff happened on the state level. And that's where the rubber really hits the road with, with the sector. As far as the federal, in, uh, federal, um, uh, federal policy goes, I think stimulus will be, uh, has the potential to be infinitely more positive than negative. Um, I know a lot of people, have, again, have been concerned about inflation and higher interest rates. But as my earlier slide showed, if the economy is getting stronger, it tends to be good for good for utilities. And the opposite is when the economy is doing poorly, like in 2008, that's when the utilities have had their worst, uh, their worst run. So again, if the stimulus comes in, <coughs> uh, you know, particularly if it's infrastructure spending, there's a lot of things I can think of that would be positive in terms of uh, either tax credits of some sort or even direct government um, stimulus. You know, there has been this um, broadband initiative that the federal uh, Communications Commission basically um, awards rural telephone companies money for building out broadband networks. That kind of thing, again, you could really ramp that up and uh, un under the context of that. Are they going to do that? I don't know. Um, it is an issue where uh, the president could go with the Democrats in Congress and probably forge some kind of consensus uh, on that. But I think there's a lot, of, a lot to be written uh, in that, in that, uh, of that chapter. Um, you know, as I mentioned with tax reform, I think we're, uh, you know, responding to a question. Uh, the devil's in the details, but the worst case isn't that bad. You've got uh, Wisconsin Energy and, and Next Era Energy part, uh, Next Era Energy answering a lot of questions during their, um, uh, during their um, uh, conference calls this time on those issues. And, you know, even the worst case isn't so bad, but you could, you could actually imagine a pretty positive case for, uh, for utilities coming out of that. And again, we'll have to see what happens. But um, I think the most important thing, though, is that is the next point there, and that's utility investment plans. And I went to uh, the Edison Electric Institute's annual financial meetings. It's an opportunity to go and chat with, uh, or basically just be in a room with the people that run all these companies. Very interesting. And they kind of map out, they have their own meetings, and they kind of, but they kind of will map out uh, to analysts what's going on, what they plan on doing. 
<laughs> and one of the more interesting things there was when I went there were, were all these five-year, ten-year plans that they uh, uh, had mapped out and how positive they were going to be in terms of lots of little investing, lots of little investments um, that add up to all, add up to pretty big numbers. Um, and one thing I was really interested in is if, the, if that would be changing after the election. Well, now that we're seeing you know, more guidance calls, really, um, nothing has really changed. So um, that's, a, that's a big positive because utilities are about investment, as I'm going to point out here with all the companies that I have. When they make an investment, it goes into their rate base, and um, that's what earnings are drawn off of, and that's how they raise dividends. And the big difference between the capital spend you see right now with utilities versus what you see uh, elsewhere. I'll talk a little bit about more about this in a minute. But the big difference is it's in a lot of small projects. It's, there are some big power plants being built right now, but primarily most of these things that are going to fuel this growth are, are the little things, like building our little energy storage system plugged into the grid, smart grid, um, uh, maybe a, a natural gas power plant they can put up in a year and a half uh, and shut a more expensive facility like a 50-year-old coal plant, for example. The wind and solar tax credits, I mean, that's another big issue uh, for utilities particularly because we are seeing them make a lot of investments in that area and, and particularly some of the companies like Southern Company that have turned Southern Power really into a contract solar uh, growth vehicle. So are they going to, that business obviously is affected by um, if they do away with the, the tax credits, but it looks like that they're just going to phase out as they were going to, which they phase out by 2020. And again, that's another kind of a positive thing. Uh, pipelines, this is a negative thing. You know, uh, pipelines, I think, may get a little bit harder to build here. Uh, there are several reasons for that. Um, one is the fact that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that approves all these projects, is they don't have enough commissioners to form a quorum. They, had, they were down to three, uh, three people, and the chairman resigned. So now they're down to two. So they've got to appoint more people there, and now you have a number of projects that are kind of stopped right there. But there's, and there's some other reasons too, and I'll talk more about those tomorrow. But this is a negative that I don't think a lot of people are talking about or thinking about. There are other, you know, another reason why I think also just a political kind of um, reaction to say reopening uh, Dakota Access Pipeline or uh, Keystone Pipeline. Um, and that has uh, stimulated a lot of fundraising on the part of uh, organizations, law firms, and so forth that oppose pipelines. So um, it's very possible that there, you know, with all this more money, we're going to see more pipelines challenged. So that's a negative um, that not, I don't think a lot of people are focused on so much, but they, you know, they're uh, something I'm looking at very closely. And it's a reason, I think, to be very selective about the pipelines you buy. And then finally, um, you know, this is, I guess, just sort of as you can guess, because I've alluded to that before. We focus on individual stocks as winners and losers, uh, not necessarily the big grandiose plans that everybody else does. I'm much more interested in finding a company that is an individual beneficiary of this election, say um, a utility operating in Missouri where they're going to do regulatory reform now because of the way the election turned out, because people aren't paying attention to that kind of thing, than trying to guess what tax reform is going to look like. Um, you know, again, a lot of, if, if 1986 is any indication, there's going to be a lot of uh, horse trading going on, and we'll see what happens. I mean, I, you know, I read, the, I read uh, pretty, try to read, try to keep up with what's going on, but um, as long as we focus on the individual companies as winners and losers, I think we're going to come out in good shape. Now, this is, gets back to that pipeline thing. I just wanted to make this, this point. This is pipeline approvals by uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission over the last eight years. Um, and it's been pretty bullish. They pretty much have approved everything uh, that has been put before them. There are, there are pipelines that are delayed, but those are pipelines that are um, primarily in the states. So pipelines that had to gas pipeline that has the Constitution pipeline has to cross New York State. State won't give them a water permit. Um, so FERC has been there saying, "Yeah, build it," and they've also streamlined the process. I mean, it's it's really extraordinary going through and, and it was extraordinary going through and finding this out. But you know, in 2009, obviously there's a lot of activity because energy prices had been really high and 
companies just completed the projects. But then you had a big drop off in terms of new projects. But over that, uh, you know, because of the financial collapse and no one could, was affording, could afford to do this, plus demand for energy dropped off a cliff. But over the course of that, of that next, uh, you know, several years, uh, activity really accelerated. And um, that's a lot of pipeline miles. So I think, I mean, the point is, is that, um, you know, that, that is an area that I think uh, there's going to be um, probably a little more turmoil, a little more problem than, than we think. Um, so again, I, you know, um, first part I was going to tell you about was who we are then, uh, in our approach, um, a macro view. Now let's take a look at some of the opportunity areas that, uh, that we see right now. And most of these are what you'll find in uh, Conrad's Utility Investor. I borrowed a little bit from Energy and Income Advisor. Um, but uh, these are recommendations you will find in that, in that publication. Um, you know, utility investment, they're investing in a lot of small projects, but they're building very big numbers uh, with dividend growth, 7 8%. Yieldcos, um, these are uh, vehicles that were set up to kind of mirror the master limited partnerships. And um, almost as soon as they came out, <coughs> or within a year of when they came out, there was a co crisis of confidence in the business model. So a lot of people dumped all these YILCOs, and the YILCOs depended on, like, like a lot of the MLPs, outside, cop outside capital to grow. The parents of these YILCOs would drop down assets, in other words, sell them on favorable terms. The parent companies would maintain control of the assets by control of the YILCO, and, they, and investors would get a pretty nice yield. But when, what made it all break down was falling share prices, which made it more expensive to do these drop downs. So I think this is a good, I think we have entered a good opportunity for that, as I'll, I'll explain. Um, MLPs, uh, I'm very excited about the gas plays. I'm going to talk a little bit about alternative energy. Um, Mexico, and then uh, a play on Mexico. And uh, which may surprise you. And then also uh, a little bit look at bonds. We have a bonds. I basically have four portfolios in the uh, Conrad Utility Investor. I've got a dividend reinvestment portfolio, which is more or less how I have, have invested in them over the years. Uh, conservative holdings, which are dividends um, and uh, basically capital appreciation following dividend growth. An aggressive portfolio. And then finally, we have a bond portfolio. So. The, again, this is what I'm going to be talking about, and I'll just say briefly, you know, if you're interested or if you have to, if you do have to leave for any reason uh, during this, I'm happy to share these slides with you. Um, I'll be uh, sending them to Sherry, and uh, she will be uh, distributing them. So, first to start out on uh, with utilities, and uh, this is a this is a graphic that uh, came from the Edison Electric Institute meeting, and it basically shows you where money is going to in terms of what utilities are spending it or you know capital spending on. So the, the blue there is uh, environment. A lot of spending there, right? Um, the, 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 uh, the, the orange is distribution, uh, the, the gray is transmission, uh, the, the um, yellow is gas related, uh, the blue is generation and then other is at the top. Now if you notice there, um, you know, there, there's been really a, um, uh, a, you know, a real kind of transition, I guess, in terms of what utilities have spent money on. It used to be they spent a lot of money on long-term uh, large power plants. Now it's all talk, now a lot of it, again, is, is smaller things that they can get into the rate base and they can build their uh, earnings from. So this is, the, uh, this is the pillar of support for that, and this is the, uh, a map that I always run after an election. Uh, and uh, basically it sort of rates, it's my own rating of regulatory environments. Why is this important? Well, because utilities are not going to <coughs> be able to earn a return on their investment unless they have support of the regulators. So this is a map that, uh, this is kind of where we stood more or less around the time of the election. I think um, we're going to be able to, to uh, color that, uh, that Missouri uh, orange here very shortly, possibly Kentucky. Um, and um, if you look at the map as a total, as a whole, you can see that most state environments are very positive for utilities. So that's really the driver of what's going on here. Um, and this is one area, again, of investing. And this is a map of states that have renewable power standards. Some of these uh, slides, I'm sorry, didn't come through that well in the keynote. 
but uh, this gives you an idea where you have that the green are where you have actual standards, the yellow are what they call voluntary guidelines. But what this basically means is in all these states, the utilities have to buy a certain amount or build or contract, whatever, uh, a certain amount of wind, solar, or something that's a qualified renewable source. In Illinois and New York, that's become nuclear power now. But what that basically means is a lot of development has to occur in order to meet these uh, regulations. And this hasn't changed. Uh, this, this, is not cha this hasn't changed since the election. In fact, um, in Maryland, they've actually um, increased the, several of these states actually have increased the renewable energy mandate. So uh, they're certainly not, uh, that, again, that's may not be what the federal government wants to happen, but it is driving that type of investment. And this is a graph, I think. I love maps, obviously. Uh, but this is, a, this is one of my favorite graphs. It just shows where's the solar radiation. You can see where solar power is suddenly, you know, fairly competitive with almost, you know, with most things out there. I mean, the big problem with solar energy is that it, the sun's not always shining. And uh, you have to have, all, you know, some sort of storage or you have to have mainly peaker plants come on, most of which natural gas. But again, this is driving an investment opportunity that uh, utilities are taking advantage of. Another graph illustrating this, uh, you know, this shows you why utilities are basically taking this market. I mean, it's just utility scale facilities, large facilities, <coughs> they can build a lot cheaper and run a lot cheaper than your conventional uh, rooftop unit. Um, and uh, that's almost a two to one margin, actually, a big utility uh, that was, as of 2015 versus something that Solar City might put on your roof. So again, they have a huge advantage here and they're expanding and taking advantage. Um, wind power also, it's become pretty competitive in certain areas of the country. Uh, and this is, this is a, an interesting graph that you probably might want to look at in a little more detail. It just kind of shows you how various uh, sources of energy match up at different, uh, at different fuel costs and so forth. <coughs> And you can see how things have, you know, and again, things have changed a lot. Um, so my first pick here, and again, some of, the, some of the slides didn't come through, but this is a company called Algonquin Power and Utilities Corporation. I'm just going to talk about it for a minute. Uh, it's basically a regulated company that, um, the C as the CEO calls himself, he's a serial uh, power plant developer. I, I don't know how many of you might have invested in the Canadian Trust back in the... Um, previous decade. This, uh, this company was a private, privately held company based in Canada and it went public as an income trust. Um, grew for a while under that model and then they of course had the Halloween massacre and they decided well we're just going to go uh, become a corporation and they started a, 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 they adopted a business model that basically saved a, a lot of their cash so they could actually grow without having to access outside capital. So now this is starting to pay off for them. They just bought a company called Empire District, and uh, which is a big utility, a lot of, in Missouri, which I, again, like I mentioned, I think is an improving regulatory environment. And what the, what the result is, is, um, and again, none of my Algonquin slides came through, but uh, what's, what the result is, is 10%, a company that yields about 5%, dividends growing about 10% a year, and it's just now listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And, um, you know, when, from when they completed that deal. So it's not a company a lot of people are aware of at this point, uh, but it is very aggressively run, and at least in terms of uh, a growth perspective, a long-term growth perspective. It's very conservatively run from a financial perspective. Uh, one of the graphs that I had here actually shows you how they're projecting cash flow to vastly exceed uh, actually what they're paying out in dividends. So they've got this formula in place, growing these dividends, and Again, I think uh, a lot of good things ahead for them. They're, again, a big, de they're a developer of uh, uh, wind and solar. They anticipate replacing a lot of the capacity in Missouri that Empire District now owns. A lot of plants that are 50, 60 years old with gas or with some of these alternatives. So, what is, so that would add to their rate base. It would also enable them to cut costs. They can cut um, future environmental liability. And um, again, adding to earnings, adding to growth. So AQN is the symbol, and I'll have a list, of, a summary list at the end of this showing you what these, uh, what these are. But that's a utility, I think, that's 
definitely a pretty good, in a pretty good position for, for long-term growth. Um, again, Algonquin Power and Utilities, AQN, and I've, it'll be on the last slide. Um, you know, Yilcos. So uh, the Yilco model, um, and you can pick up uh, copies of Barron's and so forth tell, talking about you know, how it, uh, how it doesn't work and how it's broken, but this is an example of one that um, Next Era Energy Partners, where it's definitely working. This is a map of their, um, where their portfolio is. It's all contract, uh, wind and solar, all, and a pipeline system. Um, but it's all things that are long-term contracted, that generate steady cash flows. And their parent is uh, Next Era Energy, which a lot of you might know is, is uh, Next Era, um, as, as the parent company of, uh, and again, this is, I don't know how this happened here, but I think I can get some better slides uh, <clears throat> to you. But this is kind of making a point of what they're doing and also um, one thing that they did do um, earlier, which was, or, or just a couple of weeks ago, Next Era, the parent did, which was basically get rid of their IDRs um, or, or pair them back pretty dramatically. So Next Area Energy Partners is growing its uh, dividend by about 12 to 15 percent a year. Um, it's been a recommendation of ours for a while in uh, Energy and Income Advisor as well as <coughs> a Conrad's utility investor. It's just taken a nice little pop up in the wake of uh, doing away with these IDRs. But what you have right now is a company that I think deserves that valuation. And as they increase their dividend over time, I think we're going to get nice capital appreciation going forward. So um, NEP is the symbol on that one, and um, it's the only Yilco that has an investment grade parent and doesn't have any exposure to residential solar. Um, it's all contracted stuff. Residential solar business, um, you know, Solar City was taken over by Tesla. So I don't know, we, you know, we're, I'm very interested to see how it fits in in that organization, but I can tell you uh, right up until it was taken over, it was bleeding ever greater amounts of cash flow. It's a broken model. There's nobody in that business that's actually made it, that's actually making money. So um, Next Area Energy Partners not being involved in that business to me is a very big plus. And also having an investment grade parent, which again is Next Area Energy. So if you're going to buy one Yilco, that'll be the one. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I mentioned gas and particularly uh, MLPs is another opportunity area. This is a, a graphic that uh, Elliot and I pull out and it just sort of shows you where we are in uh, the energy cycle, kind of takes energy cycles apart to some extent. Now, um, I have to brag for him because when, this, when the market was up around between that green and yellow, which was early part 2014, he came out with a call for um, prices coming down from that 110 to one, uh, 100 to 110 range down to uh, 30 bucks or lower. And in fact, he had a, a low target, I think, of $25. Well, you know, we got to 26, you know, and change, 26, 36 or something. Um, and that was, uh, again, a pretty dramatic cycle. But what you saw was a lot of things, a lot of things selling off. And at some point, we came to the point where we got down to that, that uh, quadrant on the, on the right, uh, lower right side, came over into that, uh, um, and right now, um, where we think it is, is down around between that blue and that orange. We think we're going to probably be in there for a while. We've talked a lot about lower for longer energy prices. And what does that actually mean? Well, it means that a rising tide's not raising all boats. It means you have to be selective about what you buy, and it means costs are so important. Uh, just in the way, same way they are with utilities. I mean, a lot of that utility spending I was talking about is in small projects that actually allow them to cut costs because we really aren't seeing huge demand growth in electricity. Well, by the same token, um, there's a glut of oil out there. There's a glut of gas in North America. And every time we've seen um, prices pick up for a little while, we see drilling pick up. And I know OPEC cut dramatically. It's, um, it's um, or at least try, is trying to cut uh, what's coming out, but as we're seeing, U.S. shale uh, has brought its cost down and it's producing at 50, particularly in cer certain basins. Um, again, not a rising tide raising all boats, but certainly better situated companies are doing well. So that's the way to really think about this energy price cycle now. And here's, you know, again, lower for longer, 40 to $60 oil, 
Business is local because you have these different basins. Some are cheaper, some are others. Cost cutting is critical. Fee base is no guarantee. I don't think I have to tell anybody that who's owned stocks like um, uh, Enbridge Energy Partners or um, Ener uh, Ener Energy Transfer Partners or any of these companies that have cut distributions after telling us for all this time they weren't going to cut. They, they got over levered, they got a little bit too aggressive, and certainly we've seen a lot of midstream companies cut even worse. Some aren't around anymore, um, but there are companies out there, there are midstream companies that are doing really, really, really well in this lower for longer price environment, but you have to be selective. Um, beware of the names that are leveraged energy prices, another, that's another you know, way of saying that. A company that depends on $100 oil to survive, you don't want to own it. I mean, even now, even though it's probably has crashed and burned. No revival for coal. I mean, uh, it's possible, I suppose, but you know, as long as we have all this low-cost gas and as long as utilities can uh, make money, cut costs uh, by retiring coal plants and bringing on new gas, you know, that's what they're going to do because they can, if they build new gas plants, they can add that into rate base. They can shut these old ones down, old plants down, cut their costs. Again, it's, that's a, those are very tough economics for, for coal prices. Here's a graph that uh, some people have asked me to, to put up, and this is where the shale lies. Uh, in the, um, uh, it's a graph uh, courtesy of, of um, uh, Energy uh, Information Administration, but it's actually an Enterprise Products Partners uh, graph. And it shows you where all these big, uh, big basins are. Someone suggested to me at the booth that we should just put this on the, on the uh, EIA website. And, um, that, that does sound like an interesting idea, and at least with a little update. But again, showing you where these basins are, and there really are serious economic differences between these basins. Um, you know, the, the Permian Basin, a lot of activity going on down. But if you look south of there, the Eagle Ford, it's sort of all coming out of there. So this makes a big difference as to where you want to own pipelines, and I guess that's my, my main point here. Uh, one big use for, for pipelines is getting gas to utilities. This graph shows some scenarios uh, from the Energy Information Administration, how much gas we're going to be using. But the point is, we're going to be using a lot more. It's got to get to the utilities. And this is a map of the pipelines um, from, uh, uh, you know, the, right now that are, that are out there. Um, and uh, they don't hit everywhere. They, they don't bring gas to the places where it's needed. So again, those are opportunities. On the other hand, there are pipelines, say, running gas from the Rockies to the east. Those are not that so much needed anymore uh, because we're producing a lot of gas in the Marcellus, the Utica shales, places that are that much, um, that much cheaper. But again, a lot of pipelines to be built, but maybe some pipelines that are not going to be um, fully, uh, fully stocked there. So um, I do have a pipeline pick for you. And uh, unfortunately, some of the slides I have didn't come through. But this is um, Dominion Midstream. And the symbol is DM. It was a cheaper stock uh, two or three months ago, but I think there's a lot of upside for this one still. This is its. This is a project. You know, and I mentioned earlier on that a lot of states are uh, blocking pipelines now, and that opposition is really picked up. So that's a disqualifier for a lot of pipeline projects. But this is one that um, uh, DM is bringing online, and it basically is bringing gas, as you can see, out of the Marcellus Shale into markets. In, uh, in Virginia, and it also extends south uh, well into North Carolina. So this pipeline, the, 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 the um, developer is Dominion Midstream, and it's uh, um, partly owned by, uh, it, they're the majority owner, but its main customers in the Carolinas are uh, companies uh, like Duke Energy. And they are also not only customers, but they're also part owners. So this is a pipeline that has been moving ahead pretty expeditiously because it has support in these areas, and that's a reason to, um, to, to uh, so DM is the symbol, Dominion Midstream, uh, and again, I'll have it on the, on the summary slide. Right now, yields, I think, around 4%, but it's growing the distribution at 22% a year. Has a pretty clear pathway to do that. Atlantic Coast Pipeline is one of the, one of the places. They're also building, and if that slide had, had uh, appeared, um, they're also building a, a liquefied natural gas export facility in Maryland. And they've basically staggered these projects to support 22% dividend growth. The bigger that organization gets, 
I think we'll see more drop downs from uh, Dominion Energy, which is a major uh, natural gas pipeline midstream company. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the old consolidated natural gas, but they, they uh, merged with that uh, back in the 90s, actually. Um, consolidated natural gas used to produce a lot of gas. Dominion sold all that gas pretty much at the top of the market back in 2005 and focused on the pipelines. So again, uh, that, was a, that was a pretty nice move, I thought, but um, they, are, they do have a lot of infrastructure that they can drop down to Dominion midstream, keep that growth rate going. DM is the symbol. Um, you know, uh, and these are, these are very interesting graphs, but uh, I think what I'm going to have to get stuck with here is um, what, what, what is really the driver for grid investment right now? What's one of the main drivers? And that is uh, the dilemma presented by increased use of intermittent power sources such as solar. And this is a graph from the California Independent System Operator. And it's, they call it the duck chart. And basically what it is is um, you can see this is a typical day in California. Um, and you can see that now we're down 2016. But <coughs> a lot of down those are more projection. But you can see at the beginning of the day people get up, use electricity, um, and before solar it would, the demand on the grid was pretty stable. And then people would come home and spike up watching TV, turn on their computers, Boom. And that's still the case, right? People are still doing that. People are still, um, and the power demand is um, uh, spiking up at that point. But what's changed is um, demand for grid-based power has dropped dramatically because during the day you have all this, res all this solar. Um, some of it's residential, some of it's um, utility scale, a growing percentage of it. But it's all power that depresses demand for what used to be the baseload power. and um, natural gas, uh, or, or um, in particular, uh, nuclear power. They're shutting down the biggest nuclear plant in the state, actually, the only one running. Um, but that's, that's caused a dilemma um, for, first of all, for power producers, companies like Calpine, which reported in earnings this week that um, I think that 20% of their capacity in California didn't make its bids and was earning zero cash flow. So what do you do if you're earning zero cash flow? You're going to shut down that capacity. And you get into, again, a bigger, a bigger problem. How are you going to make the beak, uh, the power demand of that beak um, in, uh, at the end of the day when people come home and the sun's gone, gone down? Well, you've got to do a lot of it. You've got to do a lot of investment. First of all, you've got to do a lot of backup power, and that's what they're doing now with um, some of, the, some of the technologies, peaker plants and so forth. Um, it's driving investment in storage, which is, you know, it's moving along, but, um, and it's certainly well ahead of where it was a few years ago, but it's not adequate to make up that big of a shortfall. So again, a lot of investments being driven here in, in the grid, um, and utilities have, have embraced it in places in California because, again, it, it's investment that can go into rate base, and, and increase earnings. It also helps them cut costs, which keeps the rate impact down, but it's a, it's a viable uh, business model, and again, caused by this very, uh, very re you know, this duck chart situation. So what is a company that I think uh, would be interesting to buy off of that? Um, actually, uh, and, and this will uh, kind of surprise you, but this is a um, southern company, and symbol is SO. And this is a graph from their uh, presentation in, um, um, the, at the Edison Electric Institute meeting. And I was able to chat with them a bit about it. But this is kind of where they see their business going. I mean, they've got um, uh, a lot of its regulated businesses. And they just bought um, at the Crosstown Atlanta um, gas utility, <coughs> AGL. And so that's increased their regulated environment. But they've also bought. Um, and, and expanded in um, several other areas. Um, this company called Power Secure, which they acquired, has made them a big winner, or a, it's given them a big presence in um, uh, distributed energy and those types of technologies. So uh, that maybe their rivals would have been doing um, in the past, now Southern is embracing that. And again, it's a business that will help them cut costs and it's a, biz it's a new revenue stream. 
Uh, this is a kind of a graph of Southern's um, where they see their capital spending, and you can see <coughs> mostly it's on uh, mostly what they're doing. Very little new generation, actually, uh, but huge on transmission and distribution. And again, those transmission distribution projects are much easier to get up and running. They, they are environmental uh, pond closures. Those are uh, uh, coal um, ash ponds. And all these big utilities that used a lot of coal in the past suddenly have been confronted with the fact that um, because of the, what happened in North Carolina, uh, the leak from the, the Duke Energy um, coal ash pond, that they had this massive liability sitting there that they need to do something about. So what have these companies done? Well, they've gone to their regulators and said, we have this massive liability. We've got to clean it up. We've got to do, make it safer. And um, that's now able, that's now an investment that's going into rate base. So again, uh, that 9% new generation actually includes the Vogtel uh, nuclear plant. So even this company that's building the biggest, has the biggest capital uh, project out there, um, its generation spending is not that big of a part. And uh, this is a graph, again, just talking about the regulatory environment. They probably have the most, one of the most easily top five regulatory environments in the country. Um, and that's very big for utility investors. This is so Southern Power. So this shows you where they, as I mentioned early on, that they had kind of become a big player in contracted solar energy, a lot of it to uh, US military facilities. They started out just as a gas company. So those G's are where they had natural gas plants in Georgia. Um, they would sell to factories or to <coughs> um, you know, any uh, municipalities and so forth. Well, now they found the solar business is quite profitable. And um, if you look at their earnings, they're, very po they're actually not reporting fourth quarter until the end of this month. It's a big company, a lot of moving parts for one reason. But um, look back at third quarter, it's really becoming a driver. So uh, multiple drivers here in all these, all these various areas. Uh, and um, again, I mentioned the gas part of the business. They are big investors in gas uh, pipelines as well. They bought uh, half of their, the pipeline system that Black um, shown that serves their, um, uh, their, their utility business. And uh, they bought that from Kinder Morgan. So now they're Kinder, Morgan, uh, Kinder Morgan's partner uh, in that project. So again, very nice, um, very nice picture. Uh, I've had a buy target for Southern of up to 50, 50 or lower. And I think that's still a pretty good price to look at. Um, it's a big utility, so there's a lot of opinion about it. But I think that the fundamental value pro concept, I guess, is a yield uh, between you know four and five percent, and dividend growth that of mid single digits. So that's an, it's a nice and, and very sure kind of areas. A lot of diversification. So again, they're uh, they're now uh, a leading player. The, the, the largest coal uh, fired utility up until recently is now uh, a big player in, in other areas, making that transition. <laughs> I mentioned Mexico. I wanted to just talk about a, a play I have in Mexico. And this is a, a trend that um, I don't think will, uh, shows no signs of slowing down. It's basically, we have a lot of gas, and I mentioned a gas glut in, um, in the United States. Uh, but Mexico um, produces, their, their electricity system runs primarily on fuel oil, which is probably the most expensive way to generate electricity around. So they're making a big push to run everything off of something that's a lot cleaner, a lot cheaper, and the US is, become a huge beneficiary of that. Um, there are a number of pipeline companies that have taken a big presence in that. One Oak is one, and I, I, we write a lot about that. In, uh, it's also an in, in energy and income advisor, but it's also a portfolio company and um, Conrad's utility investor. They're doing, and they're rolling up their limited partner. But they're a big player there. Kinder Morgan's another big player there. I wanted to give you a company, though, that I'm, you probably have not um, heard of. And this is a company called IE Nova. And IE Nova is uh, basically the um, investment arm of Sempra Energy, which is a big California utility, probably known for Sa San Diego Gas and Electric or um, uh, Southern California Gas. That's still, the majority of their income comes from that. But they've been very aggressive in investing in some other areas, and particularly in the US, liquefied natural gas being one. Um, solar energy being another, and they have this IE Nova uh, unit, which um, 
is expanding pretty rapidly in Mexico. Um, they, most of their revenues are in dollars, so they don't have that exposure, but they do, Sempro does have a huge advantage that it can convey to IE Nova, and that is um, US dollars are going a lot further in pesos now than they were six months ago. So they're very much taking advantage of uh, this opportunity to invest, and they have a lot of different areas that they can invest in um, to, in to increase growth. This is a company I think I would best describe it as paying a variable uh, dividend. They, that's part of a kind of a conservative cash management policy. But again, they're, they're doing a lot of things here that are adding uh, considerably to, um, to, to uh, incremental cash flows as some of these uh, um, points here make. Um, and uh, this is one we, uh, I, I came away actually from the Edison Electric Institute with, and I put it in this report that I do after I go to this conference, and it's actually, you know, already um, come up well above where we, um, where we initially got into it, but um, at a price of around four and a half, I think is a good price to get in. This, I'll, I'll have a symbol for it in a minute. You can buy it in Mexico. It's a different price, of course, there, but um, the, the five-letter symbol in the U.S., i.e. NVF, uh, at $4.50 or higher. And it's actually also, there's an overlap that's also in our energy and income advisor portfolio. So the last opportunity area I just want to talk about here is bonds. Um, bonds don't get a very good uh, um, airing, I think, these days. And I think it's because people tend to just look at the group, maybe in the same way a lot of people look at utilities, just kind of monolithic and completely depending on what happens with interest rate policy. Um, and, you know, at the mercy of the Fed and so forth. And that's true of a lot of bonds. And we have not been bullish on most bonds for quite some time. We used to have a, I used to have a portfolio um, of, it was basically investment grade paper. And there was a good, there was a time for that. Basically, you know, in 2009, even companies like Dominion Resources would have um, a debt, five-year debt that had yield a maturity of nine, eight, nine percent. Well, those figures now are, you know, low single digits at best. Um, and what, what do you get for that? You don't really get, so pretty bad return, pretty low return, but also a lot of risk. So, you know, investment grade utilities, cost of capital is still n near all time lows. That's a big positive um, for, any, for companies that are, you know, buying or investing and building as utilities are doing. Uh, are making acquisitions of other companies and so forth, but it's not so great for bondholders. One thing that uh, we learned a few years ago that uh, was very interesting was uh, talking to um, pension fund managers is that they basically have to go in and buy a certain number of bonds at any given time. And uh, they have to buy whatever is on, on the market. And with so many utilities like paying debt down because interest rates have been low, um, they've had to basically take whatever has been offered. Now, a lot of utilities have also um, pushed out debt maturity so far on the, on the scale that they really have very minimal refinancing risk, even though they're big, you know, they use a lot of debt. So um, those, are, that, those are, again, things that work against you as a bond buyer. What happens if there's tax reform and interest for bonds uh, is no longer uh, tax deductible? Uh, another another kind of wild card, uh, you know, for, for the issuing company. Another wild card there, but <coughs> there are a lot of special situations where that's not the case. And just as dividend growth is a antidote to rising interest rates for stocks, um, a improving credit profile is an antidote to rising interest rates for bonds. So what we've done is basically, and again, I have a portfolio that. Uh, is in Conrad's Utility Investor that we keep up with um, about every six weeks or so, update it. Uh, not, not a lot happens, but what they are, what they, all those bonds have in common, there are companies in the coverage universe that aren't in the pink of health right now, that none of them have investment grade ratings, but based on my analysis of the companies themselves, they're getting stronger, and that's a powerful offset to uh, what we might see with interest rates. So. That's, um, again, that's, a, I think, a, a, some, uh, it's an area to look at. And again, we do have this portfolio. This is showing you the portfolio as of the last time that we, that we ran it. Um, there's a, a wide number of companies. They are all in the coverage universe. Uh, they range uh, from uh, Alaska Communication Systems, which is uh, 
real small little uh, wireline uh, broadband company in, in Alaska. But again, an improving credit profile. Um, Atlantica Yield, a yield co, um, that unlike Next Area Energy Partners has ran, ran into some troubles at one time. They're, basically their parent went bankrupt and there was a, a, a number of, uh, uh, a lot of confusion about cross defaults and they basically had to uh, ring fence themselves from their parents and try to convince um, the lenders to these power plants they had that they could make good on the note themselves and they shouldn't enforce the cross default. So they're getting this done and as a result these bonds are, are starting to improve. So again there's a large number of different uh, different uh, securities there. Some of them we've, we've uh, recommended selling. Dynagy is a big um, independent power uh, producer company and got a big bump in the bonds at following the election because they're also a big coal producer. But one thing that uh, is, is that has happened to them um, is that the value, the net present value of their power plants has basically dropped off a cliff over the last 15 years. And the reason is wholesale power prices are still going down. So they're suffering and, and we saw that, um, we, we, we see that in earnings uh, uh, consistently so we sold and got out of that. But again, there are a lot of opportunities here and you know, if you're interested in this, it is, it is a topic that we look at um, in, uh, in, in the letter. So this is a, again a look, of, a look at uh, or sort of a summary slide as I mentioned um, for you of, of the recommendations I have. Uh, we are very much stock pickers like I said at the beginning and uh, we do um, a lot of, uh, I mean I'd say the bias is more or less buy and hold. I like to hold dividend paying stocks so I can collect dividends. I think to a large extent short term trading is, can be self defeating but we are in uh, moving into year nine of a bull market and valuations are pretty high. So we've kind of tweaked the system a little bit and some of the, some of the stocks that, that you'd see if you pick up a copy of the letter, we've actually advised people take money off the table in. Some we've advised outright, there's a number of outright sells. Most of those are based on um, uh, you know, fundamental problems but a lot of them are based on valuation these days. Uh, there really are very, a lot of our coverage universe, I covered 204 essential service companies and I've been covering more or less the same group but with a few uh, entries and exits over, you know, for about 30 years now. Um, they're very resilient, durable companies but I've also been through a number of bear markets and I know you have too where you've seen great companies suddenly lose a whole lot of value and you thought, why didn't I just take a little chunk and put it aside and then when prices came down buy some more. So. Again, another little strategy to tweak here in, as, we, as we get to the end of the bull market um, eventually. I mean, it's going to end eventually and we're moving into year nine and valuations are so high. But again, these are the exception and I think, again, if you look at the market from an individual stock point of view, um, you'll see that uh, there are always values, there are always things to buy. So, if, you know, if you're interested in getting, um, as, you, as you leave, I think he's, Johnny is like scanning people. Anyway, um, I'll just uh, put up our, this is our product line. Um, yeah, we do have, uh, you can't, the special report is basically these slides. Uh, I think you will get a better copy. Uh, and there are a number of slides in here that I think are pretty interesting that didn't get to show you. But um, thanks for coming. I'll, I will uh, stay and take a few questions if you, anybody has them. Thank you. And Elliot.